Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 1971 Italian giallo film, The Night Evelyn Came Out of the Grave. And if you've been watching my channel, you know I'm huge into giallo. I've been trying to watch and review as many giallo films as possible. That said, I've seen a decent amount of giallo. This is my least favorite of all the giallo I've seen. I'm just throwing that up front. But I will say I'm glad I watched it once. I don't think I would watch it again. There's a decent concept in this uh, film, but execution's not the best with this one. So, I don't know. I'll, obviously, I'll get into it. So, this one's directed by Emilio Miraglia, Miraglia uh, who also did The Red Queen Kills Seven Times, which, when I'm doing this review, I haven't watched yet, but I will be watching. Hopefully, it's better than this one. Uh, written by Miraglia as well as Fabio Pitoru, who wrote scripts for The Weekend Murders, The Red Queen Kills Seven Times, Shadows Unseen, Nine Guests for a Crime, and Macho Killers. I like that title. And Massimo Felisati, who did scripts for The Weekend Murders, Shadows Unseen, Strip Nude for Your Killer, that's an interesting title, and Dark Friday. Uh, this film has nine different edits. Uh... <laughs> Uh, some have said that uh, certain versions of it, certain edits of it, since there are nine, are just totally incoherent. Uh, knowing that there are nine edits of it, I would like to see the edit that is edited down for a more succinct story. Because there's a lot of time wasted in this film that didn't need to be. It does drag a lot, in my opinion, and it really needed to be edited down. There are a bunch of scenes that just... Like, the scenes can be there because there's a point to them, but they just drag on way too long to the point where you're just like, we know what you're getting at here. Like, we get the significance of this. We get the point. You can move on. It's kind of like the director thought that audiences are super stupid and it's just like, leave it on there for, for so long to make sure they get it. It's like, people are smarter than you think. Uh, a heavily edited version of the film ran on late night TV in the United States under the title of Evelyn Raises the Dead. I think that's a worse title than the one that's on this. <laughs> uh, so the very beginning of this film, obviously we have um, who I believe it was Alan freaking out at the asylum or institution or whatever it is. Uh, the acting with that was really funny, in my opinion. I was kind of laughing a little bit out loud when he was, like, running around. He's like, ah, ah, ah. And you could tell that the when they're showing, like, from his point of view of, like, the blurred vision, you could tell they literally just took, like, smudged up glass and kind of, like, moved it around in front of the camera. So, didn't look that great. But then again, you know, this was 1971, so you have to keep that in mind also since this was 1971 you also have to keep in mind the fact that be <laughs> it makes sense that there's a lot of sex in this uh there is an insane amount of sex there's a lot of nudity and back then that was one of the selling points not just for the italian market of film but for you know the united states and japan uh nudity was a thing so they would a lot of the times try and throw in as much as possible it just it does seem excessive in this uh, it's just like every time you turn around, at least for the fat first like half to first two thirds, I don't know. There's there's a decent amount of getting on going on. You can tell. Oh yeah, I already talked about that. Sorry, man. This guy in the car is suspicious. That was Alan at the time that I put that note down. Uh, the questions he was asking alone made him seem like a serial killer, which we then find out he in fact is a serial killer. We only see two murders or two what we think at the time is murders um and uh one's confirmed later the the first woman that he's with then susan actually survives we find out in the end which initially after she had died i kind of questioned i was like is she actually dead because you didn't really see her die necessarily and then the whole thing that happened with her lighter showing up in his room i was like you know she might not be gone and she may have something to do with this but then i the the story moved on so much and it there was so much of it that passed since susan was gone that i then forgot about her basically so when she came back at the end i was like oh so from that aspect what the director and writer well writers and director had in, intended for you to kind of forget about her really it happened in my instance for sure uh, the nice surprise, 
the this excuse me there's a interesting surprise when they go to the castle with this guy alan uh the guy who seems very very suspicious and changes his license plate on top of that when he goes to the castle it's totally dilapidated it looks like it's abandoned and then there's this surprise moment of like they go into this actually nice room and then later on you basically find out that alan lives there he just doesn't really care about taking care of the castle which i believe has to do with the fact of you know, Evelyn, his wife, having passed, and he's so just, like, out of it, you know, he's lost it, basically, hence all the killing and everything, that he's just not up doing any upkeep with, with the place, and I think the dilapidated uh, version of what the castle looks like is kind of supposed to be a parallel with his, with him, with Alan himself, to show kind of the deterioration of the property and the deterioration of him mentally because of Evelyn passing and they are connected obviously uh initially when I saw Albert like Albert going around being a peeping Tom so initially I was like who is this guy peeping and watching him torture and kill women and then I realized though know, Albert was Evelyn's brother which it's still weird that he was like following Alan around like that and peeping on him but I guess he was just doing it for basically extortion purposes being like oh i know you murder people i know you tortured people and um where's the money because that's what he does every time he shows up he's like oh here's some cash you know keep it cl keep your mouth closed so really none of these people really have morals be because on top of that you have the doctor who i assume had already treated alan at that point and released him knowing that he was killing people and he's just like oh you gotta stop this and it kind of seems like pretty much everyone's in on it within the family for the most part um but they're just like oh naughty naughty boy it's it doesn't make any sense it's so weird and that's another one of the problems with the film in general is that you can't really really root for anyone so much especially not by the end of the film because you realize that everyone's garbage like, everyone's garbage. Like, even how you're supposed to feel at the end where, you know, Alan gets it all figured out and he puts one over on George and Susan and Gladys. But he's terrible. He murdered people in the beginning of the film. So you can't really feel that good about it. I mean, what would have been best is if everyone goes to jail, honestly. So, uh, I don't know. Um, it does get a bit confusing early on in the film because they throw so many characters at you early um, it takes a little bit for you to kind of, you know, be like, okay, now this is this person and this is this person and this is their, their, uh, backstory and this is theirs. So it's, it's a lot at first. It's a lot, but it does slow down enough so you can catch up. Um, the shot transition from the dark at the crazy cat where the strip, the stripping was going on with it. I think it was Susan. Yeah, it was Susan at that point. She was doing her strip routine, which was very macabre and weird. Uh, and then the, all the lights go off, and then you see a lighter light up, and she's lighting a cigarette basically for um, Alan, and then it starts like panning back as the lights come on. That was a cool transition from like the lights going out to coming back on. Uh, I really like that. Um, and there are a few of those kind of flashes in the film of you know good cinematography, like real nice cinematography, good directing, these inspired moments. After the beginning events, you immediately feel dread as this new woman, Susan, goes to the castle with Alan. So for that reason, it was a good setup in the beginning for to show the torture and killing. Because then when Susan's going with him, the audience members are just like, oh no, you don't want to do this. You know, it's that old, you know, audience watching a horror film. Like, don't go in there. It's like, don't go to the castle. And then the fact that when these women get there and see how dilapidated it is, rough. But, you know. We then find out that Susan was in with the, in the whole, you know, in it with him for the whole thing. George, that is. First inclination would be to think Albert returned Susan's lighter to Alan. So I think maybe he was kind of placed as like the creeper going around watching Alan for the reason of people kind of thinking that, you know, it wasn't necessarily Susan who was still alive and moved the lighter that it would have been Albert, which that's what I initially thought. Um, so it did seem to me that the whole, like, killing thing for Alan kind of had to do with him looking for someone else to kind of take Evelyn's place or someone who kind of felt like they were Evelyn to him. And then when they didn't feel like her or they didn't, like, 
pass his test as being Evelyn enough that it made him angry and he just felt like he needed to punish and kill them. I don't know if anyone else felt, felt that way. Um, it wasn't fully fleshed out. And actually, it feels like it kind of just got left at some point because of the fact that nothing happens to Alan in the end. He's, like, treated as some sort of, like, victim or hero. I don't get it. It's weird. Like, weird. <laughs> uh, I assume the aim of all the maids in blonde wigs at, at the, uh, est well, I was going to say estate, at the castle have to do with the fact that they don't want any redheads because they don't want to set Alan off with his psychosis. So, yeah. Just something I picked up on. Uh, because they make such a big point of when um, Gladys ends up going to get the milk that was supposedly, you know, forgotten by the maids. And she says there was a redheaded woman there. Like, Alan just, like, flips out about it. And then also the point where Alan sees um, Gladys wearing a red wig from behind and he starts choking her. Which, I don't understand why. Because he's wants Evelyn back, so if he thinks it's Evelyn... He should be happy. I don't know. Like, some of this stuff doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Uh, <laughs> yeah. It's funny that Alan finds the spot where Albert and Agatha boned and thinks it's basically evidence that Evelyn came back from the grave or is, you know, a ghost or coming after him or whatever. Uh, I, I did kind of like that setup that Albert and Agatha were meeting for this clandestine boning in the woods and then oh there was a spot where they bone and alan sees it and he's like oh that's like the spot where me and evelyn did it she's coming back she's sending me signs i just thought that was funny um it's kind of excessive with the up close shots of the gloved hand carrying the snake the part where albert gets killed with that venomous snake they show the hand holding the snake so freaking much for so long it's one of those scenes i was talking about that just drags on too long where you're like we get the point stop just cut this off it's like i said i want one of the edits where they edited out a lot of the runtime because this is like an hour and 40 some minutes and it has no right to be that long it should be maybe an hour and 20 or something i don't know um that would really suck i put down that it would really really suck to be bitten by a venomous snake be dying from the venom and at that time while you're still alive buried alive albert got a terrible terrible deal there but he was also not a great person no one is in this they all suck it's suspicious when george shows up out of nowhere when alan is slapping gladys around in the woods because gladys went looking for evelyn's body um that's a clue that George was involved, and that's when I started thinking, yeah, George is probably involved, because then I started thinking back, and I was like, he has the clearest motive, really, because he's the one that's going to inherit stuff. So, at that point, I basically had figured out that he would be involved, but I didn't see that Susan would still be alive, and I didn't see that Gladys would end up being involved either, so I did like those twists to it. Uh, the twist, the final twist in the end with kind of Alan somehow figuring everything out, which they don't explain how, which I think is dumb. It's just, it's too much. They, they kind of, they already had a, a pretty good ending with the way it was with George um, getting away with it and then Evelyn, or I'm sorry, George getting away with it and then killing Gladys and then Gladys killing Susan before she dies. Like, that was... They should have just ended it right there. The whole Alan then figuring it out and not explaining how he figured it out. Terrible. Just just a bad decision. Uh, the scene of the foxes eating the dead body of Agatha. Another one of those scenes went on way too long. We get the point. As soon as... Honestly, you didn't even need to show the foxes eating. As soon as you see him putting the body in the cage, that's all you need. Then you're done. And then you can just cut to the next day. And they'll be like, oh, well, the body was eaten. They can just talk about it. It's fine. We don't need all this. I suspected George was involved because of what he stood to gain financially, but not Gladys, like I already said. When someone pours drinks, make sure you watch to make sure they drink as well, is what I put down from that whole scene where Gladys gets poisoned. I believe uh, George said it was strychnine champagne that he does not like drinking. But, um... His positioning was perfect, basically, for him, because as she's laying there not paying attention to him, which doesn't feel very realistic, she's just down in that champagne, and he's just standing there, and every time she looks back, he's like, oh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So let this be a lesson to everyone. If someone pours drinks for you and them, 
make sure they drink it. Initially, I wondered if Susan had survived, but then I kind of forgot. Yeah, I already kind of talked about that. Uh, okay, so another thing that does make sense at the end. When George is leaving the crime scene at his place, which, first of all, why would you kill people there? That's another thing. You know, he was so smart to set all this stuff up. Why did he kill these, have the, well, he planned, well, I mean, he planned on killing Susan. He said it as much to Gladys as she was dying. He was basically like, oh, thanks, because I was going to have to kill her anyway. But he seems like he's so meticulous and he had this great plan. And then he just, his plan is to murder Gladys at his place and then also Susan? That doesn't make any sense. It's just another one of these things that doesn't make sense. And then what makes even less sense and is even dumber is when he decides to take the lighter with him, which also does not make sense because it's not like if the lighter was left there, then people would know that Susan was there because her freaking body is there. So <laughs> I don't understand. And then he goes out and he just like randomly throws it in his own yard. What is the point of this? Like, <laughs> if more than anything, he's setting it up so he will be found out later like it makes no freaking sense bad writing it's bad writing um they should have attempted some some sort of practical effects at the end when george was in the pool and all that surf, uh, sulfuric acid was in there and then he climbs out and he's like yelling and screaming about it but burning and that's where they should have had some practical effects but instead they just have him just rubbing his bare chest excessively. Another one of those scenes that's just too long. Ugh, just no. No thank you. There are some moments of it, very inadequate lighting in this. And it looks bad. It looks bad. Um, that's another one of the things that really bothered me within this film. They had so many dark moments where they needed to lighten it up. Just not looking hot. The directing was not bad, it was pretty solid, but since there are so many great Italian directors from this time, solid doesn't really seem that good, because of the comparison, basically. I mean, you have to think that Mario Bava, unbelievable at that time, and um, he was making those films, and you, if you go from watching a Mario Bava film to watching this film, you're going to be like, wow, that directing blows in comparison, <laughs> so it's just kind of tough. Um, it seems there's a point here that wealthy, uh, wealth naturally puts people at ease, even when someone acts creepy and suspicious. We see that right from the beginning with everything I was talking about with Alan being, seeming like a serial killer straight up, but he had money. And that is something that actually happens in real life, that people do feel more at ease with someone if they have money. They just think, whoa, well, they must be an upstanding citizen. They must know what they're doing. They must be smart. They must... It doesn't mean they can't be a terrible person and they can't be a murderer. So, it's just a thing. Um, it's hard, like I said before, but it bears repeating. It's hard to care about anyone in this film because they're all pieces of garbage. And that's one of the problems is I feel like with a lot of films, you really should have someone, at least one person, that's kind of like, you know, you can feel good about. And you, they're just not there in this film. Just not. So, anyway, as you can tell, I wasn't a big fan of this film. It wasn't horrible, like I said. It was, um, I'm glad I watched it once. I would not watch it again, though. Uh, but I would say out of five stars, I'll give it two. I'm going to give it two stars. I don't think I would go lower than that. Because, you know, there's some nice stuff that was pulled off. And a lot of the scenery is very nice. Had a great atmosphere. Um, how dilapidated the castle looked was nice. And that kind of comparison, like I said, the parallel between... The dilapidation of Alan in his mental state versus the dilapidation of the physical castle is, is a nice touch as well. So there's some good stuff. And the acting was really good too. But, you know, except for a few moments here and there. But, you know, anyway, two stars. Uh, I would be very interested to know what other people think about this. So put some comments down there and we'll get to talking about it. Uh, and just Giallo in general if you would like to. Because you know I would. Do me a quick favor though. Hit that subscribe button if you like this video or any video I've ever done. That is your best way to repay me, and I really do appreciate it. Literally, when people subscribe, I get an email, and it tells me who subscribed. I take the time to look at it, and I think to myself, awesome. Thank you to this person. So, just trying to build a horror community here. Not making money or anything. It's just a, you know, it's a hobby. So, but I, I do enjoy it. It's fun. Anyway, thanks so much for checking this out. And until next time, keep it brutal.